3,000 days in hardcore Minecraft is a milestone I never thought I would hit. I began this journey over one year ago without any expectations, and I was shocked to even make it to the dragon fight and come out alive. But we've come a long way from that, and built some pretty crazy things like my hidden mega base that I covered at 1,000 days, and my end island transformation at 2,000 days. And that continued through day 3,000 with my most challenging project yet. By the end of this video you will see how I managed to transform an ocean monument into a highly functional futuristic civilization that combines farms, villages, and my best builds to date. The path to get there may not have been the smoothest. I had a few mental blocks, experienced some major game changes, and had to make some heavy sacrifices. But all that makes for a great story, one that I'm happy to share with you today. But in order to begin it all, I need to take you back in time to right where I left off on day 2000. Just before reaching day 2000, I was spending all my time in the end. A dark, lifeless dimension where there is nothing but chorus fruit for miles around, along with the occasional end city. Not where I was though. On the main end island, I was rewriting the story of the dimension, adding so much more vibrance to the scene through a build that worked as a wither kill chamber and an enderman farm. I had spent a whole thousand days there doing things like planting an entire nether forest, adding a piece of the overworld, and giving the endermen some new toys to play with. Can you just leave the grass where you found it? And it all made the end much more enjoyable. But I was still ready to trade it all out for somewhere better. I was ready to return to the overworld, where I can watch the sunrise, listen to the sound of rain, and enjoy the company of the kind animals that live there. This is where I wanted to spend my next 1000 days. And I had known what I wanted my next major build project to be for quite some time. But I couldn't start on it right away, because thanks to all the fireworks I needed in the end to fly over the void, I now had a major gunpowder shortage. And also, no easy way to get any. So I figured why not make some improvements to my home chunks. I decided to start this new chapter of my hardcore world by making a creeper farm that fits right into the landscape at my base. And it was actually a pretty easy thing to do. I had a giant mountain sitting right on top of my underground base that I was able to comfortably fit a series of spawn platforms in. But rather than having a drop chute that collected the gunpowder there, I built a water flow that pushed the creepers outside where they would fall from a giant creeper face I had built. Because I mean, that just looks sick. And it was a nice touch to my home. It gave me the opportunity to do a little bit more landscaping, and it got me all of the gunpowder I could ever need. And I really liked that a lot of it was hidden. It fit right in with the theme of my hidden mega base that was just below my feet. So, the one problem that was holding me back was now resolved. I had all of the gunpowder I could ever need, and it was time to move on to something bigger. And boy, I wonder what that could be. Of course it was an ocean monument project. Who doesn't like a classic ocean monument project? Listen, okay, I wasn't doing this just because they look cool, all right? I wanted to do this because guardian farms are probably the most valuable assets to me. I can't seem to go anywhere without leaving a trail of prismarine behind me. And you know, I had a guardian farm. It didn't look too great. And I make so many trips out there, and you don't know how annoying it is to go through another portal over and over and look at this. No, I need to make something that doesn't hurt my eyeballs. But not just a guardian farm, that's too simple. I wanted something more. This was going to be an ocean monument project that functioned as a guardian farm, a kelp farm, and a massive ocean village. I was excited. I wanted to start fresh on this project, not at the ocean monument that I had already turned into a guardian farm. I decided to scout out a new one to transform. 
And over the course of 2000 days in this world, where I had explored hundreds of thousands of blocks and screenshotted almost every ocean monument I've come across, I had essentially constructed a catalog of locations to choose from. So I spent a stream exploring my potential options. And after just a few hours, I had found the one. Deep enough ocean so that the monument is elevated above the ground, no landmass in the immediate vicinity, and generally warm biomes off in the distance. It was perfect. And by the end of the first night on the project, I had established a site and was ready for phase two. Phase 2 was the preparation stage for the actual build, and much like the TNT duping phase at the end island, this was the most intimidating stretch of the entire project that would require me to build something way out of my comfort zone. It made me sweat a little bit when this project started off by collecting 18 shulkers of sand. It was hours of digging, hours of placing, and many trips to the end to repair my shovel. But what I didn't know is that the materials were going to be the least of my problems. Because after all that work, I realized I had established a perimeter that was far too large to drain with sponges. I mean, it could be done, but I didn't want to spend all my time on that. I had to find an alternative way to complete this in order to keep the project on schedule. And with a little bit of research, I came across the perfect redstone machine for the job. And the best part was, I already had all the materials for it. Fast forward a bit through all the misplaced blocks, and I had completed my first ever water remover. A device that will move on its own to easily sweep water away. Almost too easily. I couldn't keep up with this thing. Within just one day, and a few passes of the machine, I essentially had the entire area in front of the monument drained out, that I would later complete with the help of some sponges. What happened here? I thought this was going to be so much harder to do. Seeing that this challenge could be overcome so easily motivated me to continue pushing onward. The monument itself, though, had to be drained the traditional way, with a lot of sand and a lot of sponges. But I was no stranger to this. I had done it in Worlds previously, so the process went smoothly for the most part. But I had the guardians there to remind me not to get too comfortable. Okay, okay. Hardcore Minecraft is a risky game after all, but trying my best to avoid them, I divided up the volume of water into 5x5 five five sections and drained each of them one at a time, and before too long, the exterior was dried out and all that was left was the inside, but I wasn't quite ready to drain that yet. Knowing that I wanted to have a guardian farm inside of the monument, I wanted to take advantage of the water that was already there and construct it before draining the rest of the interior. So with the help of a conduit, a haste tube beacon and some invisibility potions, I went to work removing all of the blocks from the inside of the monument and framing a water tank I would use for the farm. And it was really scary mining here with all these guardians around me, knowing that if I let one invisibility potion accidentally wear off, I may not actually have enough time to drink another before they kill me. And to make it worse, they still make eye contact with you while you're supposed to be invisible. Boots. That scared me, he looked right at me right there. I don't need scares like this in hardcore, but I pushed on, keeping a close eye on my effect times and without any issues, I got the job done. Tank built, remainder drained. This is officially my house, Guardians. Casa de Mongo, tell your friends. A Guardian farm from here was as simple as a few buckets of water up top, a couple of gates, and an assembly of campfires and hoppers. All that done in my ocean monument was officially up and running, collecting valuable prismarine blocks to be used in phase 3. Side we go. The drained area of my ocean monument had grown a little larger with a few more passes of the water remover, and it was time to really start construction. The general premise I had imagined for the project was a large courtyard in front of the monument with an elevated perimeter around it. Nothing crazy yet. And so I wanted to start by figuring out the shape of it all. With the materials I had harvested from my guardian farm, I was able to lay out a simple frame of prismarine to make up the shape of the courtyard. From there, I found a wall pattern that I enjoyed, repeated it all the way around the frame before completing it with a gateway to the nether that would serve as the main entrance to the monument. I could see that things were really coming together, but I had to step away for some other tasks. 
Two things I knew I would need in order to complete this project was an efficient way to get black dye as well as villagers. So in just one week's time, I found a river to construct a squid farm and gathered some villagers to incorporate into a villager breeder. Along with a zombie I called Dave, who would become a major part of that in a little bit. Both of these farms served me well for being such simple builds. And after building them, I got my new friend Mango, who'd keep me company at the monument. <gasps> we found him. Me and Mango. Me and Mango. But we also brought out an old friend as well. My chicken one tap, who I've had since before day 100. Congratulazoni. Woo! The Monument Squad. Upon returning to the Ocean Monument, I was overwhelmed with the presence of these hideous sand walls towering over the courtyard. For being a project in the middle of the ocean, I felt awfully disconnected from it here. I wanted to be able to see the marine life around me, but I didn't want to simply stack up a wall of glass here. I needed some more logic behind it. And it was a battle finding a concept that worked here. The biggest creative block I've ever faced in this game. I don't know. I'm gonna have to like, I'm gonna have to sit back and, and think about this a little bit more. I spent a ton of time both drawing and building to find a design I liked, but I often found myself placing so many blocks to the point where it wouldn't look much better than the sand. But after hours of trial and error in a creative world I had, I came up with a way to have the simple wall of glass that lets me see all of the ocean life around me, but in a way that physically makes sense. At least enough sense to me. I built up these four towers that act as the main support on the corners of the perimeter and banded them together with cables of sea lanterns which support the sheets of glass between them. It was the perfect blend of appearing structured while also maximizing the views. Views that were now ready to be revealed. Now it was time to really bring this place to life. Knowing that I wanted to include a village in this project, the obvious location to put it would be in the courtyard. But why do the obvious? I wanted this village to have history, to make it appear as if the villagers had been here for many generations, long before I got here. And I used the courtyard to tell that story. I built up their ancient ruins that have been overtaken by nature, and even included a series of shrines that hold some of the ancient artifacts from their time. <clears throat> Actually, those are just beacons to keep me safe. The spawn rates here were scary, I needed to include them. And I loved how this turned out. It was a beautiful garden space that connected the gateway to the monument. And the contrast between the monument and the village was so interesting to me. You never see those two things together naturally in Minecraft. But here it was, happening in my own hardcore world. That is awesome. But if I wasn't going to house the villagers here, I needed to figure out where I actually would put them. Okay, I may have lied earlier. This was the most intimidating part of the project because I had the grand idea to build my ocean village in the ocean. Like, actually in it. I started forming these rectangular volumes out in the water just outside the monument perimeter. Blue glass just like before and edged with sea lanterns so they could easily be seen through the water. All of the volumes were connected and drained, which means more sand and more sponges. Skip the draining talk and I had created a space for the ocean villagers to live. But it still wasn't ready. I couldn't take the futuristic minimalist approach and shove them all in a glass box. No, I needed to make it feel like home for them. But without the beds at least. I'm not giving iron golems any more chances after day 743. Nope. <gasps> What the f I separated these volumes into two types. The small ones would strictly be for fishermen, while the larger ones were for every other type of trade. And I decorated each to feel somewhat like a village, just to keep all the workers happy. And during all this time, my villager breeder was working in overdrive. This is so loud, and I was ready to move everyone into their new homes. But how many villagers did I want? A hundred villagers, that's right. But not just any villagers. A hundred cured zombie villagers, you heard me. I let a zombie, not Dave, Dave stayed in his box. I let a zombie punch all these guys until they turned green. 
I threw some juice on them and fed them lunch, which they really seemed to enjoy because after just a few minutes, they would return to normal, making their happy little villager sounds. Then, it was off to their new lives. But it's safe to say this process wasn't as easy as I just explained it. I did almost pop a totem in the process. Are you serious right now? Holy moly, are you serious? I thought that was about to be it. Ugh. In a thousand days, this is what almost killed me. Not a creeper, not the guardians, but a slime. A green, bouncy cube was the biggest threat to my game. Yep. Back to it, a hundred villagers, well actually 96, the other four were just bonus so that Dave could feel included. But all of them were safely moved into their newly constructed homes, working away, loving life, and looking absolutely amazing from the monument. Oh, wait, that's right, the monument. I should work on the actual monument. It had been 700 days since I started this project, and I hadn't really made any changes to the monument other than putting the guardian farm inside. Now, I've always loved the look of these, and I'd be completely fine with leaving it alone. Ocean monuments are beautiful, but I wanted to make it stand out a bit more from the rest of the builds here. So with a little bit of acacia, I gave it a lot of contrasting accents. I started replacing the prismarine blocks directly and then added a few custom changes, mostly to the base. I closed off an area underneath with a new wall design and added a small reflecting pool to the front. And in the end, the monument had a much stronger presence in the project. But the inside was still empty. I had an area around the guardian farm and the whole ground floor that needed some work. But that didn't matter too long, because I had something brewing right underneath the monument. It was my idea from the beginning of this project to bring in the story of the end, where the materials brought to the main end island are bleeding out through the end portal and into the overworld. And the base of this monument is where some of those have shown up. Hidden beneath the floor was to be a giant pit to the end. Bottomless, foggy, and dark. That actually turned out looking pretty cool. But within it was a black stone root, reaching out to grab onto the guardian farm. This was the epicenter between those two dimensions the end pushing its way into the monument, and the guardians doing all they can to fight it off. And this build still had a purpose. The Blackstone Root actually surrounds the hoppers that take the guardian farm drops and sends them to an automatic storage system below. An automatic storage system that I couldn't complete because I was out of iron. Now I had two options here. AFK my ugly iron farm at my base, or build a new one in my spawn chunks that could run even while I wasn't around. Yeah, you know what I chose. I turned this into a weekend long project because I was also feeling a bit burnt out on the monument and I wanted to build something new. It was nice to finally get a change of scenery, even if it was just for a few days. The concept of iron farms are actually pretty simple. A space for villagers, a space for a zombie to scare the villagers, and a place to spawn and burn an iron golem. But there's a million ways to assemble them and trying to arrange it in a way that looked nice took some time. But once I had a farm figured out though, I built three more to make this a quad iron farm that earns me blocks per hour. Then, decorating was an interesting challenge. Making something look good can be hard enough, but making something look good while also making it spawn proof is a different story. To make sure I didn't have iron golems spawning all over the place, I had to design with a lot of slabs, stairs, and leaves. And you know what? It actually worked out pretty well. The potted plants definitely help. But now, with this up and running, I was finally able to finish the storage system for my guardian farm. Things were finally starting to come together. I was on track to finish the project on time, but you know what happened next? 1.17 finally released and totally threw a wrench in my plans for this video. In 1.16, I had completed all of the advancements, including our ballistic and how did we get here. But updating to 1.17 would mean that I need to complete a few more in order to maintain that status. But that should be easy, right? I've done things like killing a Zoglin, finding every biome, breeding all animals, Things that are actually a grind. And now I just have to look at a parrot and get a goat in a boat? This is, this is nothing. 
Ink sack on the sign, eat the glow berry, go in the boat, breed the goats, breed the axolotl, fight with an axolotl, look at a parrot, look at a ghast, wait on some snow, wait on some snow. Hello? Okay, this took me seven hours of gameplay just to get one block of powdered snow. Snowstorm after snowstorm after snowstorm, and I could not fill a cauldron. I started with a few, got a few more, then made nine stacks of cauldrons. Oh wait, it's done. Let's go, dude, it's done. I can't believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, the most exciting moment in Switchback Mongo history. I finally get to walk on powdered snow. Was the grind worth it? Eh, no. Because I realized if I truly wanted to complete all advancements in 1.17, I would have to respawn the Ender Dragon at my completed end project just to look at it. 1.17 keeps getting worse and worse. But hey, axolotls are pretty cool. I was really struggling to decide if I was actually going to follow through with this. But rather than sitting around to think about it, I went back to the monument to finish all that I could by day 3000. The final missing piece to this build was just a kelp farm, and man did I have a cool idea for it after all this time. I started with a frame in the ocean, to fit right in with the village, and within it, I constructed a kelp farm that used a flying machine to trim any kelp that grows. The pieces of kelp that get trimmed float up to the top of the frame and then drop into a water flow that delivers them to a secret storage room underneath the main courtyard. This room can only be accessed by swimming through the caves beneath the two ponds I had, which I thought would be a little inconvenient. But it's actually almost no different than if I had stairs down into the room, and it looks way cooler. I decorated the actual storage room with a lot of the 1.17 blocks because who wouldn't? It's new stuff. And to finish it all off, I brought my zombie Dave here to protect it. But he wasn't really the best at his job. This room looks so good. This is... This is Dave here. This was it. The farthest I could push my ocean monument project before day 3000. Guardian farm, kelp farm, and village. Just like I wanted. I still had a little bit of time left to do some touch up work, but I had one more thing to handle first. My decision was made. The ender dragon had to be respawned. I couldn't go on knowing there were more challenges to be conquered. I needed all advancements to be complete again. Four end crystals. That was the only thing needed to undo so much of the work that I've put into this game. But it was also how I will accomplish so much more. This was the hardest dragon fight I've ever had. Not only could the dragon easily kill me at any moment, but I had to watch it destroy the things I had built as I slowly drained its health. Shot after shot, it broke more and more. But after a nine minute battle, victory once again. And only a few days left until I reached 3000. possible. Look at that! Oh my gosh, you see how t quick I flicked on that? Go ahead and accuse me of cheating. Go ahead and accuse me of cheating. Go ahead. Say it. I spent the last few hours on stream after the fight, touching up the messier bits of the monument, adding some decoration around the guardian farm, and taking down things that I don't need anymore before sharing the final sunrise with all of you. This was my 3,000 days in hardcore Minecraft. Day one, this is day one of the, the 4,000 days project. This is it. Do I consider my ocean monument project complete? Not at all. But is any project ever complete? No. No matter what you make in Minecraft or in the real world, there is always room to improve and expand. But am I ready to move on? Absolutely. It's been a pleasure sharing this journey with you all, but there's a whole other dimension that I have yet to build in. This is all far from over. So, until 4,000 days, if I can survive, you know where I'll be.